Hey guys, this is video part two of chapter 19. Um, again, I'm using a new PowerPoint that is posted in the shared class files. Um, so if you want to follow along on that PowerPoint, it'll make more sense. Uh, but I'm picking up on slide 10. Um, I just finished talking about the, um, the example with the gaseous molecules into uh, round bottom flask with a valve. Uh, I'm just going to move on from that. I think a lot of this is fairly self-explanatory after what we've already talked about. So I'm going to move to slide 11. Slide 11 introduces the second law of therm thermodynamics, which is uh, the universe is heading towards the greatest entropy. What that means is everything that happens, every process will always increase the entropy of the universe. There is nothing you can do that will lower the entropy of the universe. Okay. Even if your mom sends you to your room and says, put away your laundry, and you take all your laundry and you fold it up in piles and then you uh, put it in your drawers and you clean your room up and everything, you are organizing your room. If you consider your room to be the system, you are lowering the entropy of the system. However, all the work you're doing and all the energy that it, you're releasing is being dissipated into the surroundings. And while you're organizing your clothes and all the thing in your room, the energy release is making the air molecules move around more randomly and you are increasing the entropy of your surroundings. If you look at the amount that the entropy of your room decreased and the amount that the entropy of the surroundings increased, the surroundings entropy will increase by more than what you were decreasing the system. So entropy of everything you do, uh, the entropy of the universe will always go up. Okay, way to look at that, entropy change of the system entropy change for your surroundings together they make the universe and if you combine those two values no matter what you do the the sum of these two things will always be greater than zero giving a positive delta s the universe so when we start looking at different uh, substances and what their entry values are again these numbers are going to be listed in appendix c of your textbook but we want to have some general ideas in our head of how entropy values are, uh, like how you can predict them or calculate them. Uh, so if I'm comparing for one substance, the different physical states, obviously the, the physical state that is the most organized is a solid. Um, specifically a crystalline solid is gonna have a high level of order. Um, all the atoms and ions have a specific position that they're gonna maintain. Um, so the entropy of a crystalline solid is going to be extremely low. If I compare that to an amorphous solid, like glass, it's not nearly as organized, but the molecules are still kind of locked in place, um, so it's going to have a slightly higher entropy. Then if I go to a liquid, and a liquid, the molecules are moving around pretty freely. They can't really escape the liquid phase, but they are moving, so it's going to have a lower level of organization. So it, liquids have a higher entropy value than solids, but then when I go to a gas, if I take a bowl of water and convert all the molecules to a gas, the molecules go everywhere, so the entropy value is going to go up a lot. So that there's a huge increase in entropy between liquid and gas. So, if the universe will always increase entropy, then how can we say that water will spontaneously freeze if we cool it below zero, zero degrees Celsius. Because if we take liquid water, convert it into solid, ice, the entropy will decrease. How would you explain that? Well, basically it brings us back to the same concept we said. The entropy of the universe always increases, but our water in our container is the system. We lower the energy of the system no, excuse me, the entropy of the system going from a liquid to a solid. But while the entropy is going down, that's also an exothermic process. So as the liquid water freezes, it releases heat to the surroundings. The heat that goes into the surroundings is going to cause molecules to move around, and the entropy of the surroundings is going to go up. Again, this increase is going to be greater than this decrease. So when I add them together, I'll have a positive delta S for the universe. Now, if I look at a reaction, 
sometimes I can look at a reaction and tell, oh, you know what, that reaction is going to give a positive in change in entropy. Other reactions are going to give a negative change in entropy. Some reactions you can't tell. Okay? But when I look at one, uh, this is uh, sucrose, which is uh, table sugar. If I take sugar crystals, dissolve them into water, well, crystals are highly organized. In order to dissolve sugar into water, I have to break up that crystalline structure and the molecules start moving freely in the solution. Dissolving a solid into solution is almost always going to increase the entropy. Okay, now there's a little warning with that though. When you dissolve things into water, you have to think about, we learned in chapter 13, solvent, excuse me, solutes as they dissolve in water, sometimes the solvent molecules are going to surround the solute, and that solvation that's occurring is a level of organization that forms. And the more strongly those molecules around the solute get attack, attracted to it, forming uh, metal complexes, uh, then you can, in some cases, have a reaction like this with a negative entropy, but that's unusual. Just want to throw it out there that it is a possibility. On the other hand, if I take a gas and dissolve it into water, that's pretty much always going to be a decrease in entropy because anytime you lose gaseous molecules, that drop to any other phase is going to be a huge drop in entropy. And even when weird things happen, it's not going to overcome that. So anytime I go from a certain number of moles of a gas to fewer moles, that's always going to be a negative uh, delta S value. And then if I do compare temperatures, as I raise the temperature of a sample, molecules are going to move around more freely, more randomly. So again, that's going to increase the entropy. Uh, when we talk about entropy, there are different ways that molecules can randomly move around. They can move from one place to another. It's called translation. They can vibrate in different ways where the bonds can kind of come in and out and where the atoms come closer and further out. Uh, they can, bonds can bend towards each other. Um, you can have molecules that spin, so that's the rotation. So there are lots of different random movements that can occur that can represent the entropy of a molecule. Um, so those are our modes of motion. You should be familiar with those. Uh, but it, when we raise the energy, it's going to increase the amount of movement you have in each of those cases, uh, and that increases the entropy of the uh, sample. So what's our reference? If we're talking about entropy, we're talking about how disorganized it is, there always has to be something you're comparing it to. So we consider the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. That's going to be the most organized system possible. That's going to have an entropy value of zero. Everything else is going to be calculated based off of that. So only a perfect crystal at zero has perfect order. And at zero Kelvin, there's no movement going on of molecules because there's no energy. So that is the perfect organization, S equals zero. Based on that and other calculations, we can find the entropy val value for a lot of common substances in appendix C. It's the same appendix that we looked at before to find delta H values. So if I look at this reaction, can I predict whether this reaction will have a positive or negative delta S value? Okay, so again, a minute ago, I stated that if you look at the gaseous molecules, that's rule number one. On the left side of the equation, I have one plus five gaseous molecules. So that's six gaseous molecules on the left side. On the right side, I have three gaseous molecules. If I go from six gaseous molecules to three gaseous molecules, that's a pretty significant decrease. So I'm pretty sure that this, this reaction is going to have a negative delta S value because I'm removing gaseous molecules. I'm putting them into the liquid form. That's definitely going to decrease the entropy. I can also make straight up comparisons. If I were to compare like one mole of solid CO2 versus gaseous, gases are always going to have a higher entropy. So that's an easy one. If I compare two samples of different pressures, nitrogen at 0.01 atmospheres versus nitrogen at one atmosphere, the one that has a higher pressure is going to have more molecules involved. If it has more molecules involved, 
then that's going to indicate there are more microstates and more different ways to arrange it. So it's going to have a higher entropy. So higher pressure definitely corresponds to higher energy uh, entropy. And then when I compare one mole of two molecules to each other, uh, the larger molecule is always going to have more degrees of freedom with it. So HI will have a higher entropy value than HCl. Assuming that it's the same amount and the same uh, temperature for the two. Now, if I'm looking at a reaction and I actually want to calculate delta S, I'm going to do it just like we did delta H in chapter 5. I'm going to look up the values in the appendix. I'm going to add up the values for the products and put them here. I'm going to add up the values for the reactants and put them here. It's going to be products minus reactants. Keep in mind you have to include the stoichiometry. So when I add up the products, you're going to look in the appendix and find the value for CO2 gas. Make sure you do pay attention to the physical state. But I, I need the value in the appendix is for one mole. I need to make three moles. So it's going to be three times the number in the table. Plus, I'm going to look up the value for liquid water and multiply by four. So three times CO2's value, four times water's value. Add those together. That goes here. Then I'm going to look up C3H8. You write that value down. I don't have to multiply it by anything because it's a 1 right there. And then the O2 value, I'm going to multiply by 5. Add those together. That goes right here. Products minus reactants gives me my delta S for the reaction. Now, a key here in chapter 5 with delta H, we, didn't, we always told you that you didn't have to look up the elements. We said the delta H of formation value for O2, we know that's going to be 0. That's not true with entropy, though. Remember we said that for entropy, the only thing that has a zero value for entropy is a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. None of these are perfect crystals, and we're not going to do this reaction at zero Kelvin. So we're never going to have an entropy value of zero for any of our components here. You have to look all of them up and do the products minus reactants. All right, so if we're talking about spontaneity, will a reaction happen or not? We stated earlier, you have to think about entropy, you have to think about enthalpy, and we have to be able to combine them together somehow to predict whether it's going to be spontaneous or not. The way we do that is we, there, a new function was defined called the Gibbs free energy. It's given the symbol delta G. And basically, if we calculate the value of delta G, we can look at that value by itself and decide if it's spontaneous or not. Now, delta G is derived from delta H. Remember we said delta H, it could be endothermic or exothermic. We'd rather be exothermic. That's better for spontaneity. Delta S, we really want to increase the entropy. Again, that makes it more likely to be spontaneous. But we have to combine those two values with the temperature to get delta G. Okay. Once we calculate delta G, well, when we, de when we develop this equation, this delta G is related to the entropy of the universe, which we said the entropy of the universe, the change in entropy of the universe always has to be a positive value. And if it's positive, plug it in this equation, that corresponds to a negative delta G. So what that means is, in order to have a spontaneous reaction, delta G has to be negative. And if you find delta G and see that it's negative, that tells you, oh, hey, this, this reaction is going to be spontaneous in the forward direction. If delta G is positive, that tells you that the forward reaction is not spontaneous, which means the reverse reaction will be spontaneous. So if I have a set of values, I have a reaction, 2SO2s plus O2 equals 2SO3s, I want to calculate delta H, delta S, and delta G, all under standard conditions. How would I do that? Well, first of all, I'd look in the appendix. If I look in the appendix, I can get the numbers I need and calculate all three of those values. Okay? So if we look in the appendix, here are the values for delta H's, here are the values for delta uh, for S's. It's not delta S on that until you start subtracting them. And then there would be another column in the appendix for delta G. And for delta H, I'm going to do products minus reactants to get the delta H of reaction. For delta S, I'm going to do the same thing. 
products minus reactants to get delta S. If I had the delta G values, I could find delta G the exact same way. We will do that sometimes. But in this problem, we want to find delta G a different way. We're going to find delta H and delta S first using those values. Then I'm going to plug those into the new equation that we just learned on the previous slide. Once we've determined delta H and delta S, I can plug them in to this equation. I do have to have a temperature. So I plug in delta H, delta S, and the temperature. And once I plug all them in, I can find delta G from that. So I kind of had two different ways to find delta G. I can look the numbers up in the appendix and do products minus reactants, or I can plug in delta H and delta S with temperature and get it this way. Okay, so on this problem, it wants you to use that equation. Okay, so my video is getting long. I'm going to cut this one off and we'll pick it up on the next slide.